I started in Formula One at McLaren in 1989, which was a, a, as head of aerodynamics, which for a, a young sort of guy fresh out of university was a, a tremendous opportunity and, cha and challenge. Um, working with Ayrton Senna and Alan Prost, uh, McLaren at the time were winning world championships. Um, I then went to, briefly to Tyrrell, then on to Sauber. Um, I went there with a guy called Harvey Postlethwaite, who was a great mentor of mine and a fantastic uh, engineer in, in Formula One. Um, and from Tyrrell, when that shut down, sadly, um, I went to Jordan, uh, working with Damon Hill and uh, Eddie Jordan, had a fantastic couple of years there was headhunted to go to Renault uh, by Flavio Briatore, uh, so a couple of ca colourful team owners to work for. Um, then headhunted by Toyota to be technical director there, and after that moved on Force India, and eventually set up a Formula One team from scratch, which was Lotus Racing, which became the, the Caterham Formula One team. Um, uh, so a varied career, big teams, small teams, but um, fantastically interesting. I speak on a, a sort of whole variety of topics. Obviously, uh, motorsport in general is something that interests people and a lot of stories to tell uh, about motorsport and the char colourful characters that it involves. But I think behind that is using that as um, a sort of vehicle to um, talk about management, um, how to manage teams, how to manage winning cr and create winning teams. Um, how to incentivize and, and empower your workforce um, and, and, and how, to, uh, how to win in industry. Um, and those lessons from Formula One are, are absolutely key in, uh, in any industry. Um, the great thing about Formula One is you've got this very rapid and visual uh, performance indicator. So I always used to say at Toyota because they were very keen on their KPIs, their key performance indicators. and. I used to say, well, Bernie Eccleston publishes a really good one every two weeks. It's called the World Championship Table, uh, and uh, you can be fill, you can be, you know, 100% on all your KPIs. But if you're tenth on the World Championship Table, it doesn't really matter. Um, but those uh, those lessons uh, and how to manage winning teams uh, and uh, getting that message across of how to do that is something I find really interesting. In F1, F1 has always been cyclic. If you look at uh, who's winning, one team wins and dominates for several years in a row. Um, at the moment, Mercedes have won for the last three years. Prior to that, Red Bull won for four years. In the late 80s, it was McLaren when I started. Then Williams in the mid-90s dominated. Um, then Ferrari with Michael Schumacher and Ross Braun dominated. And that's all about building a team. Um, it's the team of engineers that win you races, not the superstar driver. Um, yes, of course, they can make a difference and you want the best driver, but actually it's building that team of people. And what happens is when those teams break up because they get poached, because all the other teams want the good engineers, that's when teams slip off the top and get replaced by uh, someone that's building for the future. So the key is team building and getting the maximum out of the, that team of engineers. Actually, that was initially a term of endearment. Uh, a truckie at, uh, at Tyrrell called uh, Jolly, who was a very funny guy. Uh, when I turned up working for Harvey Postlethwaite, he, he initially chris christened me Harvey's Pitbull Terrier. And that got changed to Harvey's Rottweiler and the name stuck ever since and actually people then assumed it was because of my management style and being snappy and that and I can at times be very to the point to get what I want done but um, I think uh, the trick of managing any team whether it be in Formula One or anything is a to show good leadership uh, ensure that people are incentivized they want to do their job they, and, and ensure that they can make a difference um, that they're empowered, so you listen to them, you listen to their ideas, and you let them achieve. Because, uh, as I said earlier, if if uh, the best managers are on the golf course, 
it's a great adage, but it should be, because if everyone's doing their job properly underneath me, I shouldn't have anything to do as the technical leader. And uh, I always used to say, I mean, a Formula One car is made up of 4,000 parts, roughly. And I could sit there and say, for each of those 4,000 parts, I want this or I want that. Um, but if actually none of those ideas are on there, because everyone in my team has contributed a better idea for each part, then we've got a much quicker racing car. And I haven't designed any of it. But what I've done is empower them to do, use their skills and design it. And, um, and and the great thing when you're the technical leader in something like Formula One is I get all the credit and I haven't actually done anything. But what you've done is empower your team to achieve. And that's the key of good management. Taking risks in terms of the design of the car and with any sort of um, technology sport like Formula One or sailing or an aviation, you know, sort of space technology, there's inherent risks and you have to be very aware of that. And the safety of the driver is, is absolutely paramount. Um, and Formula One has made great strides. I was on the pit wall in 1994 when Senna was killed in Imola, Roland Ratzenberg the day before. Um, and that that was you know some great lessons learned there and Formula One actually has managed itself to make the sport safer and safer for the driver um, I mean inherently driving racing cars at 200 miles an hour isn't safe um, but you have to um, you know take responsibility um, for the car and for the driver um, ultimately he gets in it and he makes his decisions and takes the risk but you just have to be aware that you know there's an individual in there that can can get hurt and every time the car goes out of the pit lane you know I as a technical director was responsible for, for the driver's well-being for making sure things didn't break and um, and that everything was as safe as it could be uh, so it's you've just got to make everyone aware of the responsibilities of what they were doing and as I said I remember talking to Ken Tyrrell on the pit wall in 1994 on um, in qualifying after Roland Ratzenberger had been tragically killed and I said to Ken Tyrrell several teams were packing up and didn't want to go out and I said to Ken Tyrrell um, who'd obviously been in Formula One through the 60s and seen terrible tragedies um, and I said to him, what do you want to do, Ken? And uh, he looked at me and he said, track looks clear, Mike. Let's send it. And uh, I sort of hesitated and he said, Mike, if you haven't got the stomach for this, off you go. Otherwise, send it. It's our job. And it was a great lesson to me. And actually, uh, uh, Ukiyo Katayam went out, did a great lap, uh, came in and uh, very poignantly said, oh, it was a really good lap. Um, apart from it was very uh, oily up at the Tosa hairpin, which is where the accident had been. So, um, you know, sort of for a young guy in Formula One, very strong lessons to learn, but, um, you know, it's part of the job. I think one of the most important things in Formula One, actually, when uh, you see how cyclic it is, how teams win because they build uh, a winning team of engineers together, developing your own in-house style and looking forward um, yourselves is absolutely key. When I started as an aerodynamicist, one lesson I learned early on, people used to say to me, when you go to the first test or first races and look at all the other cars, do you look at the bits on them and think, oh, we must copy that? Do you rush back to the wind tunnel and put those bits on? And my answer was always, well, of course we look, but actually what we see may be interesting, but it should be the 15th or 20th thing we want to try because we should have 15 or 20 better ideas ourselves. And if we don't, there's something wrong. And the team that's winning isn't going and looking at anyone else's car. They didn't have anyone else's car to look at to design the winning one. They had to do that themselves. So that in-house style and sort of winning culture is as true as any other industry as it is in Formula One. So, you know, you never win by watching what everyone, watching the win, what the winning car's doing, because it's quicker than you. You're not gonna catch up by doing that you catch up by having better ideas yourself. Setting up what was Lotus Racing that became uh, Caterham was, was 
probably the pinnacle of my career. You know, you never think that you're going to get the opportunity to start a Formula One team from scratch. And it came about because the FIA under Max Mosley at the time wanted to encourage smaller teams to enter. So they had um, they had a sort of competition for for new teams. They wanted three new teams, and I was approached actually by a Formula Three team to do an entry for them. Um, uh, which didn't succeed initially because we didn't have a budget um, but the FIA were impressed with the technical presentation we put forward um, and then uh, I was approached by Tony Fernandez of Air Asia uh, who wanted to back a Formula One team so we resubmitted our entry and uh, very late in September got an entry into Formula One so we had five months to not just build a car and be on the grid but build a team at the same time and I remember going in on that first day um, September the 16th and there were four of us um, uh, there was uh, my partner Sylvie Shamluffel who went and sat on the front desk and became HR, PR, press, marketing, everything and uh, there was myself as the technical director, a general manager and uh, uh, a production manager and they looked at me in sort of uh, disbelief and said, what are we going to do now? And I said, don't worry, I've got a plan. And they all sort of looked quite relieved. And I said, well, I'm the technical director, so I'll design it. Keith, you're the production manager, you make it. And Paul, you're the general manager, you do everything else. At the moment, that's it. And they sort of looked at me. But five months later, we were on, um, on, on the grid in Bahrain, both cars finished the race. We were only one of the new teams to get across the line. But that was because of the people we employed. So from that sort of four people beginning, uh, we got in good people and it's people that makes things happen. IoT is the internet of things and really we're all used to using personal computers now and the internet and connectivity, emails and communication. And it's really the extent, uh, it's the extension of that to everything around us. So, um, you know, it's, it's your washing machine talking to the person who's gonna service it and telling it that its bearings are failing. It's, it, it's switching your, your lights on in your home, security lights, security. It, it's about connectivity, not just, you know, with computers and us interacting them, but interacting with everything uh, that we use in our everyday life. And um, if you look at Formula One, Formula One's been doing that for 20 years in, in terms of using the data from the car to improve the car, to improve reliability. And uh, Formula One, 20 years ago, we used to test, run the cars thousands of miles around a racetrack, and yet they still used to break down all the time. Now we do hardly any on-track testing. It's all done in the workshop and on test rigs, and yet the cars are practically 100% reliable. And that's because we're using all that information that's available to us to design better product, products, quicker products, more reliable products that don't break down and achieve what we want them to achieve and uh, the Internet of Things allows us to do that. And Formula One's been doing it because of, you know, it's at the cutting edge of performance and it can afford to do it. Uh, one of the things I'm really passionate about is using all those lessons that Formula One has paid a lot of money to learn and applying them in mainstream uh, automotive and aerospace and marine and using those lessons very cheaply because Formula One has paid to develop them. And that's something that's very exciting. We'll see that in all walks of life. Although I use motorsport as a vehicle for, for talking about management, uh, really any, it applies in any industry because the underlying uh, themes of creating winning teams and uh, uh, empowering your workforce are true whether you're designing washing machines or Formula One cars. Um, now, it's quite nice when you're designing Formula One cars to watch the race every other weekend. It's quite fun. You can't do that when you're designing a washing machine. But the lessons are exactly the same. So really any industry will benefit from those lessons. Mm -hmm.